Good morning, all. Chapter 14. My message this morning is entitled, The Armor Bearer. In order to set the scene for this great Bible story, we need to really go back in the latter part of uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13. Israel, led by their king Saul, is at war with the Philistines. And of course, uh, this is pretty typical uh, throughout uh, Israel's uh, history, especially during the reign of Saul, their warfare with the Philistines. Saul had gotten off to a very good start, of course, as king. Uh, he had all the uh, natural endowments of a leader. He was tall. He was handsome. Uh, he was intelligent. Uh, he had come from a prominent family. And Saul's uh, reign got off to a very great start as a warrior in that he defeated the uh, Ammonites. But Paul or Saul uh, soon came, became uh, lifted up in pride, unfortunately. Um, there was the situation where he was uh, going to battle, and he was waiting on uh, Samuel the prophet come to offer up the burnt sacrifice. But Samuel uh, delayed his revival, his, his arrival, and consequently Saul himself offered up the uh, burnt sacrifice, which was uh, a violation of God's established authority. And then Samuel comes upon the scene. He's very angry at Saul for this and pronounces judgment on Saul and says, God's going to take the kingdom away from you, Saul, and give it to a man who's after his own heart. And it says in verse uh, 15, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, after Samuel pronounces judgment against the king, Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. Now if you read uh, all of 1 Samuel 13, you'll discover that he started off with 3,000 uh, mighty men. But now he's down to just 600. And I suspect what had happened is uh, so many of his men had become discouraged after uh, Samuel the prophet said, I'm going to take away your kingdom. And they abandoned Saul. In verse 16, And Saul and Jonathan and his son and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Mishmash. Verse 19, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords and spears. For Israel has been, had been for all practical purposes now, disarmed uh, by the Philistines. No weapons of warfare. No spears. No swords. And then verse 22, So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, they were found. So only Saul and Jonathan were armed. None of the rest of his 600 men were armed. Verse 23, And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Mishmash. Now we learn earlier in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, that the Philistines had 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. 
Now that's a, that's a mighty army compared to what Saul had, only 600 men. Well, naturally, you can appreciate in the circumstances, uh, Saul's not too anxious to go into battle. Not only that, he knows he's lost the blessing of his prophet, the blessing of God, the blessing of Samuel. Chapter 14, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father, Come and let us go. You know, with Christianity, we need to always be prepared to go. Ready to go. When in doubt, go. Because that's the typical admonition of Scripture. Go. The last thing Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all nations, making disciples teaching men to observe all things I have commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we need to prepare to go. Jonathan was ready to go. And he said unto the young man that bore his armor, let's just you and I go. The two of us, let us go. Manu, Matthew Henry commented, comments on this verse and says, Great and generous souls are animated by opposition and take pleasure in breaking through. They're animated. They come alive when there's opposition. That's the great soul. Jonathan was a great soul. His armor bearer was a great soul. But of course, small, uh, Saul had a small soul. He was not ready to go. He was not prepared to go. And of course, Saul's problem was he wasn't right with God. He had already became, become lifted up in pride. He thought, it's okay to me to take authority in the priestly, the prophet's realm, uh, realm and take on his office. But God was very displeased with that attitude. Verse 2, And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And, uh, and Ahiah, the son of Ahitab, Ichabog's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. So no one realized that Jonathan was out of the picture. Remember, Jonathan had not told his father. You might say he was not really in submission to his pastor. Of course, he knew his pastor and his father was backslidden. Generally speaking, I would not encourage uh, uh, young men to take uh, such advice, go, go into such a battle with this without uh, you know, inquiring of their authorities. But of course he knew if he approached his father on it, his father would either uh, forbid it or discourage it. And Jonathan was uh, convinced that he had heard from God. But remember, Jonathan was already a, ver a veteran. He wasn't some novice. And he had already achieved great battles. He was proven. He had proven himself. He'd already proven himself to be a better man than Saul, his father. Made a better stuff, even though they'd come of the same stock. But he had a better character. In verse 4, In between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over onto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. In other words, it seemed like the, the Philistine garrison was impregnable. They were set. 
sharp rocks preventing, or so it seemed, any reasonable chances of having a successful invasion of the Philistine camp. But still, Jonathan was not discouraged. And Jonathan said to the young man that bore his armor, Come and let us go on to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or a few. No restraint. Well, where did Jonathan get such an idea? Well, obviously, Jonathan was a man of the Scriptures. Jonathan uh, knew God's will. He knew the history of Israel. I believe he got such an idea from uh, Joshua. If we can turn back briefly to Joshua chapter 23. And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all of Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. And you have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. God has been fighting on your behalf. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes. From Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight and ye shall possess their land as the Lord God hath promised you. Be ye therefore very courageous. Very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses that you turn not aside therefrom to the right hand to the left hand, that you come not among these nations, these things that remain among you, that you come not among these nations, these things that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow down yourself unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done this day. The Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man among you shall chase a thousand. No restraint with the Lord. He's able to say with many or just a few. He knew Joshua's admonition to the elders of Israel. What Joshua had to say in his old age when he was well stricken in years. The battle belongs to the Lord. For he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. And from whom had Joshua learned this lesson? Joshua had learned it from Moses Deuteronomy 32 and we discover Moses when he is well stricken in years and his old age and his uh, final song uh, to the people of Israel notice what he says in Deuteronomy uh, 32 verse 28 for they are a nation void of counsel neither is there any understanding in them He's speaking about Israel now. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight 
except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up for their rock is not our rock now the word the rock of their enemies is not our rock our rock is the Lord Jesus Christ his almighty God So one can send a thousand to flight. Two can send ten thousand to flight. And of course, Jonathan was a man after the heart of Joshua. Jonathan was a man after the heart of Moses. Man who knew the battle belongs to the Lord and had trusted in the Lord. They were students of history. They knew the word of God. And no doubt, Jonathan had been in much prayer and must have heard from God in his determination to go into battle. It may be, he said to his armor bearer, it may be that the Lord will work for us. But we have to take a step of faith. We have to go. We have to come and go against the uncircumcised. Who were these uncircumcised Philistines? That's what David was to, lay, uh, to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine Goliath? These Philistines weren't in covenant with God. But Israel was in covenant with God. And if they were obedient to the covenant, notice the condition, God had promised them victory over their enemies. You know... We heard a lot about in our generation the faith message, and and uh, I, in my early years as a Christian, hung around uh, some of these faith teachers, the Kenneth Hagins, the uh, Kenneth Hope Copelands, and of course they majored in one verse of the Bible, Mark uh, 11 and verse 23, or verse 22, or verse 22 says, "Have faith in God," or "Have God's faith." And if thou will say unto yonder mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in thine heart, but thou shalt believe that those things which thou sayest shall come to pass, thou shalt have whatsoever thou sayest. Well, there, uh, I believe, is a principal thing that here that uh, Jonathan understood. He was willing to say it. He was willing to speak out his faith. I think the problem is this, this uh, principle has often been abused and it has not been effective because it's, it's put to use for selfish gain <laughs> instead of pr promote the work of God, instead of promote the kingdom of God. And so he said it. He spoke faith. He spoke words of faith. And what we speak is important. Make no mistake about it. So we need to have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. Verse 7, And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Do all that is in thine heart the armor bearer. Jonathan would never have been successful in his mission without his loyal armor bearer. In the Middle Ages, he would have been called a squire or esquire. A uh, uh, esquire or the squire was an, an attendant to the night, a servant to the night. Now the squire himself was a candidate for knighthood. But uh, it would typically uh, not be until years after loyal service as an attendant, as a squire to the knight, before he would ever become a knight himself. He had to prove himself to be a faithful servant, an armor bearer, the shield bearer. And men of God can be so much more effective when they have armor bearers, Amen. when they have shield bearers. In 2 Kings chapter 3, Jehoshaphat is going into battle against the Moabites with two other kings. 
and uh, things don't look too bad, or, or too good, really, for him at this particular time. And Jehoshaphat asked, uh, is there a prophet in Israel that we might in, in, inquire of the Lord over this, over this matter? And one of the kings says, well, here is Elijah, the son of Shaphat, who poured water upon the hands of Elijah. Now, how was Elijah known as a servant? As a man who poured water on the hands of the old prophet, on Elijah. And that's really why Elijah ended up getting a double portion of the Spirit, I'm convinced. Because he so faithfully served as an armor bearer, as a shield bearer, as a squire or esquire before he ever really went out on his own. And he was determined to follow Elijah unto the very end. Until Elijah was, God was through with Elijah. And then Elijah's ministry was really uh, more successful, I think we could say, than Elijah's ever was. Because he had spent so much time sitting under this great prophet, being his pupil, being his disciple, willing to learn. And of course, this armor bearer of Jonathan had this same spirit. Men of God need armor bearers. Some that would just be willing to pour pour hands, pour water on the hands of the prophet. In other words, serve him. Now, it's hard to find servants today. No one wants to serve. Everyone wants to rule. Everyone wants to govern. Everyone wants to do their own thing. You know, I'll say on campus, uh, Cindy's my loyal servant. Well, of course, the feminists just go bananas over that. And I said, you should not be disturbed at that. To be a servant is good. But generally speaking in our society today, to be a servant, people consider demeaning. A bad thing. You saying, are you saying your wife is your slave? I said, no, she's not my slave. She serves, she's my servant. A servant serves voluntarily. A slave serves involuntarily. The servant serves out of love. We need servants today. Jesus said, he that is greatest among you shall be servant of all. And Jesus said, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The past several years, I've had a very faithful armor bearer, uh, a very faithful uh, esquire. Now, my esquire was not a young man. It's hard to find young men today that'll, that'll serve as armor bearers, as, as esquires, so I had to find an old man, uh, well into his 70s. And of course, uh, most of you know Sergeant Rhodes. Now, Sergeant Rhodes did not get converted until late in life. He did not get converted until he was uh, well into his 60s. And I'm convinced the reason Sarge got converted is he had a praying mother, very godly mother, and this mother always aspired that uh, Billy Rhodes, we all call him Sergeant because he, he, he was a, a lifetime military man, served his country in Vietnam. He was a servant, humble man, and he always served under generals, he said. You know, attendance as, uh, for generals, typically. And he had a, a, attending a general in Washington, D.C., and, you know, when he got the call to go to Vietnam, and the general turned him aside and said, Sarge, you know, I, I need you here. You don't have to go to Vietnam. So all I have to do is get on the phone, and you don't have to go to Vietnam. You can serve me. But Sarge was the type of guy, he thought it was his duty to go overseas and not take advantage of his position. So he didn't do that. He went over and spent his year in Vietnam. 
And so uh, Sarge, of course, is, uh, is the son of uh, Timothy Rhodes. Uh, some of you know, uh, uh, Reuben certainly knows, lives out in Missouri now, but he was connected with uh, uh, Reuben's uh, ministry for a number of years, and Paul Mitchell, and um, Stephen Keeler, you saw, some of you saw that video last night, and uh, Sarge is the father of uh, Timothy Rhodes, and uh, years ago, uh, Timothy told me about his dad, and said that uh, his dad had read my book, Who Will Rise Up? And he wanted to, uh, wanted to call, uh, talk to me. So I called him on the phone, and, and uh, he's from Alabama, and he arranged to meet me at the uh, Auburn University. Cindy and I were down there, and he came out and spent the afternoon, and we went out to dinner, and you know, I told him if he ever wanted to join us on another campus, he could. So within a year, Sarge got his house in order and so on, so he could go out to campus with me. And he did that for about four years and it was very helpful to me because I'd sometimes fly into an area and Sarge would drive his van there and of course and, and pick me up when I had to uh, have the expense of, of uh, renting a van or, or renting a car myself and uh, I don't know how Reuben does it, you know, traveling with these 12 to 14 guys. I, I don't think I could handle that too well myself. <laughs> Uh, I enjoyed traveling with Sarge. I stay in my motel room. Sarge stays in his van. So I don't have some gu bunch of guys snoring and keeping me awake all night or, or a bunch of guys not wanting to take a shower and, and, and this sort of thing. And so uh, Sarge and I just got along great. And, uh, you know, he, he waited on me. You know, here, and, you know, he always insisted. You know, here's this old 70-year-old guy toting around my <laughs> <laughs> my baggage and uh, he didn't want me to do it and, and you know I you gotta allow a person to serve you yeah, right, sure, right. you know being a, a servant is on a ball office and you gotta you, you know some men are too proudful to allow anyone else to serve them sure. but uh, I got a letter from Sarge and explain why he's not here uh, this conference I'll read it to you uh, April 21 uh, 2001 uh, general and family. Well, it's been some time now since I have been under uh, the care of a doctor. I'm doing all right in that department, still taking pills and stuff like that. The last month or so, I have been getting less alert and came mighty close to having several accidents. I've also been stopped two times for driving off the side of the road and speeding in town. Another time, uh, pulled up to traffic light, looked both ways, then turned left on the red light. I think it would be better for me to stay close to home. Sounds like a wise decision. <laughs> uh, it would really be bad for me uh, to get in a, an accident far away from home or uh, something uh, worse. I thank you very much for letting me uh, travel around the country with you and others. It has been really a pleasure and honor staying around your home and family. My wife's health is downhill some and her ability to walk is slower, it seems. I wish I had gotten started many years ago going around with you. I need to repeat that line. I wish I had gotten started many years ago going around with you. But remember, it's never too late. Even if you're in your 60s or you're in your 70s, it's never too late. I will keep sending you some support. The work you are doing is really great and could not be in a better place. You give the students their last chance to become good leaders of the future. Give my best regards to your family. It's really been great going around with them. Hope everything is back to normal. Uh, hope to see you soon. Uh, best to all, Sarge. So there's an armor bearer for you. There's a squire. Important ministry. Especially if you want to prepare yourself to be a leader of men yourself. Do all that's in thine heart. That was always Sarge's attitude. Sometimes I'd ask Sarge, well, Sarge, what do you think? 
about where we should go or some decision affecting the ministry. You know, I said, well, whatever you think. <laughs> whatever you want to do, I'm with you. Do all that's in thine heart. And, of course, uh, Dave Koch has that attitude. He said, not in those exact precise words, but he says that essentially to me uh, every time he sees me. Something to that effect. Do all that is in thine heart. When, when we uh, voted at the board meeting yesterday to ask Reuben to serve uh, on the board. Serve on the board. Uh, his first comment was, well, I'm uh, a team player. The uh, armor bearer is a team player. And the armor bearer understands submission to authority. And if you're going to be an authority, uh, you have to be one who is learned authority. Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thine heart. And how much that must have encouraged Jonathan. How much that must have been an affirmation to Jonathan that he was doing the right thing. Verse 9. But still, Jonathan you know, wanted to be sure about this mission. And so he um, really was asking God for a sign. One of the providential intervention of God is what he knew he would have to have. So uh, this is what he says to uh, his esquire. If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign for us. You know, I, I think this is a good sign to ask for, because um, if they say, come on up here, uh, it's showing, you know, come up, come, come on up against us. You know, it showed some arrogance on their part. We're not concerned about you guys. We're not concerned about you two guys. It shows some apathy, uh, apathy, lack of caution on the part of the Philistines. And, of course, they, were just, they weren't trusting the Lord at all. They were just trusting their 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And so they were getting arrogant. They were getting prideful and, and probably careless. And uh, so Jonathan understood this would be a good sign to ask for because he was learning something about, about his enemy. But if they were being cautious, then that would be a sign, well, they're alert, they're ready for battle, uh, maybe we better not do this after all. For, verse 11, And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of their holes where they have hid themselves. You know, it's time we come out of our holes. The church needs to come out of its hole. The church has dug a big hole for itself. And we need to come out of our holes, come out of our church buildings, get off of our pews and go forth. Come and go. Go forth in the streets and highways and hedges as the prophets of old did, as Jesus and his disciples did, and as Paul and the other apostles did. Go forth. Get out of our holes. Verse 12, And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. Again, the arrogance. And Jonathan knows that's just what I wanted to hear. The Lord is in this. And Jonathan said to his uh, sergeant, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. He spoke the words of faith. It's done. 
If thou shalt say unto yonder mountain, Be thou removed. If thou shalt say unto the yonder Philistines, Be thou removed. And be thou cast into the sea. And shall not doubt in thine heart, but shall believe that those things that thou sayest shall come to pass. Thou shalt have whatsoever thou sayest. Now, notice what he says here. I think it's, it's important to note because it tells us something about Jonathan and his humility. The Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Not into our hands, but into the hand of Israel. He was concerned about his country, about his nation. And this was, in other words, God's people. By being concerned about God's people, he was showing his concern about God. He was concerned not for his own glory, but the glory of God and the glory of the nation that God was raising up and God was establishing. And that's another reason he was successful. And we've heard last night from both Bro and, and, and Reuben about the importance of humility. And if we get lifted up in pride, which had happened to Saul, that's the road to defeat. Pride cometh before a fall. But humility, whosoever humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jonathan was a humble man, as was his squire. You know, one of my favorite uh, uh, songs is to dream the impossible dream. This is my quest, to follow that star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to right every wrong. And then he had his loyal squire with him. Right. Ever seen man from La Mancha? The inspiring story, I think. So Jonathan aimed at nothing but the advantage of the public. Advantage of God, not his own personal advantage. Verse 13, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor-bearer after him, ever after him, ever loyal armor-bearer. By the way, Bro gave a very good message on loyalty a few years ago at this conference. If you can find Jade and dig it out for you, it would be very good. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor-bearer slew after them. And they befell, the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer. They immediately killed a bunch of them. And after that first slaughter with Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men. Within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. Verse 15, And there was trembling in the host in the field among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled in the earthquake. So there was a very great trembling. Remember what Jonathan had said to his armor bearer? Perhaps the Lord will work for us. So they took their step of faith. They went forth, and now the Lord was working for them. Jonathan understood a New Testament principle that Jesus taught just before ascending into heaven, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And so many evangelicals stop there. But we should not stop there. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Uh, they shall speak with new tongues. Uh, they'll lay hands on the sick they'll raise the dead signs will follow and it says and they went forth everywhere preaching the word and the Lord working with them yes. confirming the word with signs following God was now confirming his word and Jonathan's word one can send a thousand to 10,000. Why? Because the Lord will be with us. Amen. 
wherever two of you are gathered together in my name, there shall I be in the midst of you. And if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. And Jonathan understood this principle of agreement. If he, could, if he just got his, his armor bearer to agree, they could send those 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen to flight. The power of agreement. If you husbands and wives can just come into agreement, you wives, especially with the call of your husband, with the ministry of your husband. But again, we need to prepare to go. You know, we hear a lot about, well, don't get ahead of God. And that's, you know, that's been really abused. Most people are, are so far behind God, it's pitiful. <laughs> very, very few people are ever getting ahead of God. But on the other hand, I know what people are saying with that, and there is some wisdom in that as well. You don't go forth into a ministry uh, when you're in debt and you owe people money. You first take care of your obligations and uh, get out of debt. Prepare yourself. It takes some preparation uh, to ready yourself to go. Jonathan had spent years readying himself to go. He was no novice. He was no kid. So here God confirmed his word with an earthquake and it caused the Philistines to tremble. What's going on? What's going on? They were confused. Utter confusion in their camp of 36,000 or whatever it was. Very great trembling. And what was happening, they were now turning against themselves and killing one another. Well, meanwhile, back in camp, back in Saul's camp, the watchman. And the watchman of Saul and Gibeah, Benjamin, looked, and behold, what's happening over there in the Philistine garrison? The enemy seems to be melting away. The enemy is fleeing. What's going on? And the Philistines went on beating down one another. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now, and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Two men missing. And Saul said unto Ahiah, the high priest, Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw thine hand. We're going to go into battle. We need not pray anymore. We need not ask the Lord what we should do. It's obvious. You know, so often the will of God is obvious what we should do. And generally speaking, again, when in doubt, go. You don't have to, you know, wait to hear some voice of God. We already have the written Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Our duty is, so often it's obvious. And typically when I started going forth on the campus, it was very hard to find anyone that was willing to go with me. Of course, Brother Max Lynch, he went with me. And of course, then Sister Cindy started going with me and I began to lose interest in Brother Max for some reason. <laughs> But I, I think our duty is obvious. But what must be done if we'll just look at the Bible? You want revival? Just start obeying God's word. Do what you know you ought to do. Some of you might say, well, Brother Jed, I can never do what you guys are doing. 
Well, then do what you can do. Amen. See, most people aren't even doing what they can do. So start doing what you can do. I know most of you probably aren't prepared yet to go out and argue with these skeptics like Ken. But go out and give your testimony. Do what you can do. And you can do a lot just with a testimony. That's basically how I started with just a testimony. I had memorized a lot of the Bible already by this time. I didn't know much theology and doctrine. And a lot of my preaching would consist of nothing but going out and quoting scriptures. Like 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Be not deceived, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, I memorized all the scriptures on hell, on judgment. You know, some of my friends used to go through my Bible. It says, you know, everybody else I look at, look through their Bible, and, you know, they've underlined all the promises and all the blessings. Uh, your Bible, what's all underlined is verses on hell, on judgment, and on sin. So he said, hey, we don't need to pray on this anymore. Withdraw thine hand from the ark, high priest. Uh, we need to get in the battle. There won't be any battle to get into. Amen. Now, again, I read some of the commentators on this, and they uh, interpret this uh, uh, differently. They say, well, once again, basically Saul was getting ahead of God, hasty, uh, like he had in, in uh, the previous chapter, and offered a burnt offering, and, of course, he did get hasty there. But I, I don't think that, that that was the situation here. I don't think he was getting hasty. It's just obvious what to do. There's sometimes when, you know, uh, stop praying and start going. Yeah. And when you ask people and they say, well, I'll pray about it, I usually think, well, they won't, they won't be with me. <laughs> they won't be there. Yeah, I guess they go home and pray, says, no, no, uh, I don't want you going out and evangelizing. No. <laughs> okay, so Saul takes courage. Saul is encouraged. This man who went into you know, what we would call um, despair, what's, what's the term today? Uh, Depression. Depression. Oh, he, 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 I saw, I suppose, what physicians, psychiatrists call was a manic depressive. And he was, no doubt that's one reason he wasn't going to battle. He was especially depressed. I'm sure after uh, uh, Samuel had pronounced judgment against him. But here he was encouraged because of the action of two men. Two men. You know, Paul said, many have waxed, bond, waxed bold because of my bonds. Because of our example, many will wax bold. Verse 20, and Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came into the battle, and behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great discomfiture. Again, sort of the King James Version uses these words sometimes that seem to be quite an understatement. A lot of discomfort in the Philistine camp, to say my, great bloodshed, to say the least. <laughs> Matthew Henry commentate, commentates here, and he says, uh, Our Lord Jesus has conquered our spiritual enemies, routed and dispersed them, so that we are cowards indeed if we will not stand to our arms when it is only to pursue the victory and divide the spoils. Jesus rose from the dead and he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And he's given that power to us to tread upon serpents, serpents and upon scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. He's gotten the victory for us. We need to just pursue the victory and, and take the spoils of his victory. Not be cowards, but go forth. And many are not going forth because they have sin in their life, and sin will make a coward out of you. Sin will make you weak. Sin will make you intimidated. But the scriptures teach the righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no man pursues. 
But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Where did Jonathan get his boldness? Where did his squire get his boldness? They were righteous men who knew the history of Israel, who knew the promises of God, who had studied Moses, who had studied Joshua and other great men of God. And they were prepared for the battle and God gave them victory. Verse 21. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. What else had happened? Well, evidently, some of uh, Israel had either been captured uh, by the Philistines, that may have been some of the case, but some of them had turned traitor and actually joined with the Philistine camp. They were encouraged. First of all, by Jonathan and Zarmabar's action, then here's Saul finally, you know, going to battle with his 600 men against the body host of the Philistines, and they're encouraged. All these backsliders are encouraged. Some that even that had gone back to the world entirely uh, and, and had gone over to the enemy's side were encouraged. Why? Because of the faith of two men. One can send a thousand to flight, two ten thousand, if they're submitted to God in an agreement. Yeah, a lot of those Israelites, they were back in the mountains hiding out, but they were encouraged. And that's where most of the church is today. They're hiding out in their holes. But as we go forth, we'll encourage others. Verse 22, Likewise all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in the Mount of Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day. So the Lord saved Israel that day because of two men. Two men. Daniel 11 and 32 says, The people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If we know God as we say, all these people talking about, oh, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't believe it for a moment. Most of them don't have any personal relationship with Jesus. If they had a personal relationship with Jesus, they would be strong and they would be doing exploits for him. Consider the heroes of the faith listed in Hebrews 11. He lists many. He says, what could I say more? The time would fail to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Jephna, of Samson, of David also, of Samuel, of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, set to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. They were beaten. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And all these, having received a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. God has some better thing for us than he had for Jonathan or his armor bearer. Consider the great testimonies of these men of God that I just listed. And we could list a multitude of others. They're great exploits. But we live under a better covenant with better promises. We are men and women filled with the Holy Ghost and power. We can do it as we trust in Him and understand the battle is the Lord's. But we need to be willing to go into battle. We need to take the offensive. We've been on the defensive too long. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. We're going to battle. We're going to be warriors, soldiers of the cross. Good, 
You know, I could get into the ring with the heavyweight champion of the world and defeat him if I could get him to agree to one thing. Who is heavyweight champion now? Who? I don't know. Last one I could tell you was uh, Cassius Clay. <laughs> so in his heyday, I could have gotten into the uh, ring with uh, um, Ali, Muhammad Ali, and defeated him if I could get him to agree to one thing. Hey, you can't throw any punches. I can, but you can't. Sooner or later, I'd land a lucky punch and defeat him. And see, the world has convinced us we can't throw any punches. We've got to be on the defensive. We've got to be Mr. Nice Guy. But we're warriors, and we need to take the offensive. No more sitting in the back of the bus for us. We want to sit in the front of the bus. Someone once called me the, uh, what was that lady's name that got in the front of the bus? Rosa Parks. Someone once called me the Rosa Parks of evangelism. And you know, Rosa Parks, I remember, I lived through that civil rights era. Some of you remember, you know, Rosa Park, Parks and, and, and some of the leaders of the civil rights movement, they weren't necessarily so popular in the black community. Hey, Rosa, you're bringing the dogs on us. You're stirring up trouble. No, we don't like sitting on the back of the bus, but on the other hand, we've learned to live with it. Right. No, it's not that bad. Yeah. Adapt. But she was determined to sit at the front of the bus. And of course now she's a, a heroine, not only in the black community, but generally speaking in the white community. But I'm not content to just sit on the front of the bus. We need to start driving the bus again. <laughs> driving the bus then we can do it I'm convinced we have some Jonathans here. we need some armor bearers I hope there are no Saul's among us well our heavenly father we're thankful that the battle belongs to God Lord we're thankful for these great men that have gone before us that have left us such a encouraging example such challenging examples. Oh God, that we'll not be content to sit on our lees and just get by and just make it to heaven. But we will be soldiers of the cross. We will be warriors. We will be uh, a group. Just think, if two can ten, send 10,000, Lord, what do we have in this conference? We've had close to 100. Just half these people, 50 of them, could come into agreement what we could do in America, what we could do throughout the world. Great and mighty works. We could change the course of history as we come together in agreement, as we submit to God, as we humble ourselves, seeking not our own advancement, but seeking the public good, as, as Jonathan did, seeking the good of Israel, the good of the church, the good of the kingdom of God, not our own uh, personal ambitions. So, Lord, do keep us humble as we've been admonished throughout this uh, conference and help us to hear from you. Help us, Lord, to have this faith of God that is talked about in the Scripture. Not just faith for the salvation of our souls, but faith to do great works, great exploits, great things for you that your name might be glorified we ask this in Jesus name amen hallelujah